Good evening, everyone. My name is Brenton McGee, and I am the Performing Arts Associate here at Friends Home and Kennett. Uh, we are so fortunate to have these Meet the Musician series. This is the second of hopefully many series. And uh, this month, I invited my friend from Australia, Jai Bryant here. Uh, and I'm going to read a little bit about his background, and then he will present a lecture on his music and whatever topic he would like to talk about. Uh, and then we will um, open it up for questions um, from residents here. So here's his uh, bio. Jai Bryant is a Sydney-based Australian musical theater composer, lyricist, producer, and author with a passion for theater, education, and social justice. Using a combination of witty lyrics and hummable melodies, his work aims to inspire positive social change through a unique blend of entertainment and education. Jai Bryant's compositions are regularly uh, performed regularly on cabaret circuits all over the world, where he has gained popularity as the composer of choice for many high profile international artists. In 2018, Jai released his book, writing and staging a new musical, a handbook aimed at supporting writers and producers to get their work out into the theater world. Although Jai Bryant trained as a secondary school music teacher, he has spent most of his adult life as a youth worker and an adult educator, using his diverse skill set to better the lives of children and young people. Some of his works to date includes the Things I Could Never Tell Stephen, 2015, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020, Captain Moonlight, 2020, Sempre Libera, 2019 and 2020, The Oldest Profession, 2016, uh, The Velveteen Rabbit, 2013, In Bed with Jai and Friends in 2012, Rainbow Tears in 2007, Aladdin Goes to Africa, 2007, Peter Pan in 2006, Cinderella Meets Her Prince in 2005, Sleeping Beautifully in 2004, and many, many more. <laughs> so my friends, it is an honor to uh, introduce my favorite Australian composer and my friend, Jai Bryant. The floor is yours. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so excited to be able to just chat um, with you guys on the other side of the world. That is, I think, just one of the amazing things about technology. Um, so I, in hearing all of that, I sort of wonder, what do I have left to say? <laughs> you used up all my content. <laughs> um, so as, um, as you've just heard, obviously, um, I um, write musicals and I've, I've been writing musicals for a fairly long time now. Um, and I've written musicals about a whole heap of different topics. Um, I started out in community theatre. So uh, when I was about 13 or 14, I started uh, in the ensemble for um, the Pirates of Penzance. Um, although, um, you know, I, don't, I couldn't sing, dance or act. So, you know, how I ended up in that show is really beyond me. Um, ended up in that show, fell in love with musical theatre. Um, that fell in love with the process of rehearsing a musical um, and stuck at musicals from there on and did lots of different ones. Um, started to then um, fill in as the rehearsal pianist. Um, whenever rehearsal pianists wouldn't turn up, I'd then fill in as the rehearsal pianist and found that actually I, I much preferred being on that side of the piano when it came to musical theatre. Um, as time went on, though, and continuing in community theatre, um, there are a few opportunities there where some of the older people in the theatre company um, knew that I was writing some songs and whatever else, and they had said, you know, why don't, why don't you, we'll link you up with one of the playwrights in this community theatre group, and how about the two of you write a pantomime for the end of the year, uh, and we'll stage the show. Um, so I jumped at that, uh, and uh, over about three or four weeks, um, me and uh, a playwright um, wrote a show called Sleeping Beautifully, um, 
we then stage that for one weekend across Christmas time. Um, they had really cheap tickets. It was a family family friendly show. Um, I wrote all the songs, arranged it for a rock band. Uh, we had about of a cast of about thirty people, um, and it, it it was the highest selling <laughs> um, production that the theatre company had had. Now that's not to say that the show was very good. <laughs> um, the show, <laughs> you know, had its had its problems in hindsight, uh, but it. It worked um, and the audience seemed to love it. The kids seemed to love it. And so from there, the theatre company jumped on that process and said, let's do that now every year. So from there, every year, I had these opportunities to work with these um, different playwrights in a community theatre setting. Um, now, the thing is that in Australia, that's not something that really happens, though. Like, we don't really have a lot of those opportunities. That was sort of a very rare situation. Um, and so I've been a bigger advocate here in trying to get theatre companies to do that thing, that very rare thing that I had, I was so fortunate to have that experience. Um, I've, I've really been trying to push theatre companies to do that, to try to get particularly young people that are wanting to write theatre to, you know, engage with some of the people who may be a little bit more knowledgeable in their theatre companies to um, mentor them a little bit and then have opportunities, even if it's just for one weekend, to stage a show, see how the audience, um, you know, how the audience enjoys it or doesn't enjoy it um, because we can learn so much I think from that experience to see the thing that you've been writing usually at your piano on your own you know the peaceful quiet of your home and then to write it and then put it on stage it's quite an, a rare experience that a lot of people don't really get so to have that and to have an audience then say oh I really like that song or I didn't really like that song uh, is such a, an important process. The other part, which I found useful, is also that throughout that rehearsal process with a cast, you're getting feedback from singers. Oh, that's too high. You need to bring it down a key. Um, oh, that's too fast. I'm not going to be able to sing and dance, you know, with that song. So a lot of that process, you're, you're learning as you go, which, which I enjoy. Um, so that was where I started writing musicals. And um, I did four over four years with that particular theatre company. Um, on the side, then I was writing other shows as well. So um, starting in that pantomime space, which is a very forgiving space because it's a child's space <laughs> and kids can be quite forgiving, you know, if, if the songs aren't great or if the, the cast isn't great even. Um, and so over, over time, then I worked on a few other shows, some shows that I've never really finished, shows that are just sitting in my cupboard um, that will probably never go on stage. But um, that's sort of the space where, where you sort of learn skills and develop skills. Um, so I went from high school into a music degree um, and I majored in composition, although for a very long time there, including in high school, I was pushed down the, down the performance path. And I actually think a lot of composers probably are pushed down the performer path, even though you may not be a strong performer. And so that's, a, I think, a really tricky thing for composers to be able to then say, well, actually, I, I really actually enjoy writing and, and then finding then your voice and finding people that can support that voice to develop. Um, so I, I did a music degree, majored in composition. At the end of that degree, um, I thought, what am I going to do with these skills? Well, of course, I'll do what every other music person was doing in my degree. I'm going to go and learn how to be a music teacher. <laughs> Enjoyed that. And then, of course, very quickly realised that I didn't want to teach uh, young people crotchets and quavers for the rest of my life. Uh, and so from there decided that maybe this wasn't really the, the avenue for me. At that time, though, I'd been doing some youth work. So I'd been working with young people, particularly young people who were developing their own plays. Um, and so I eventually then went down that path because I actually thought this is actually far more fun. I really enjoy teaching people that process and exploring that creative process. So from there, I've actually stayed in youth work on and off um, for the past 15 years doing all types of things, whether it's African drumming with kids, whether it's playwriting with kids. At the start of this year, I did a program with some young people in rural Australia and um, 
over 10 weeks, they wrote their own musical, um, which is a very, very big task. <laughs> and I don't think they realized how big that task would be. Um, the youngest was 12, the oldest one was um, 19. And um, there were six of them and they did amazingly well. They, they wrote a show called Goldie, which was a, a, a take on Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Um, and we had a workshop. So I, I drove into state into where this uh, theater was and spent the weekend with the young people workshopping it. So we, we went through the script, we looked at some of the songs, figured out areas that they could do some with them improvement. So then that, that came about because of the book that, um, that I wrote in 2018, um, which is really just a book filled with steps and tricks and tips um, that I've learned along the way from lots of other people uh, about writing musicals. Because again, that's one of those things, as I said before, that um, often musical theater writers are doing it on their own. And we often don't really know what to do or how to go about it. Um, and that's tricky if you sort of think, well, I want to write a musical, but I'm not even sure where to begin. It just seems like a really, really big task. And it sort of is a big task. Um, but the way I see it is that it's lots of little tasks, <laughs> millions of little tasks. <laughs> and it's just about staying on track with that. Um, so over the years, I've written a whole heap of different shows. My most well-known show is The Things I Could Never Tell Stephen, which um, premiered in Sydney in 2015. Um, I brought it back in 2017, uh, again in Sydney. And then from there, it sort of took off. Um, it, it then went to County Cork, um, Ireland, um, Belfast in Northern Ireland twice, um, and a whole heap of different times around Sydney, Brisbane, um, and uh, at the end of last year, the National Theatre of Parramatta, which is a theatre company uh, in Western Sydney in Australia, um, they took it on and that was its first professional production. Uh, and exciting news is that um, in August, September, um, a theatre company in Chicago is going to be staging it, which is exciting. So. Um, so that will be uh, August to September. So, um, and that show is, is a very simple show. It just has four characters. Um, the title of the show says it all. It's four characters. And for them, it is the things that they can't tell this one person that they all share. Um, it has some comedy in there. It has some, some sadness in there. Um, and um, it's accompanied by a solo piano. So it's, it's like a cabaret type show. And I think that's actually why people love staging it because it's so simple to stage and we found out it's also incredibly COVID safe <laughs> which apparently is going to be a really good thing moving forward in this world that we live in now. <laughs> um, so there's that show. Um, I've uh, got a few other shows in the pipeline. I've got um, I've got a show called Captain Moonlight which is about a, an Australian bush ranger um, that's recently been finished. A, a, premiered last year in Brisbane, um, which is um, in Queensland in Australia. Um, and I couldn't get there because our borders were shut down. I don't know if you guys had borders shutting down as we have, but um, you know, our states have, have whenever COVID has sort of posed a bit of a threat, they've, they've sort of closed all interstate travel. So although that state, um, weren't in lockdown and they were still able to run with the season of my show uh, because I live in a different state I wasn't able to get across the border basically so uh, which was a bit of a shame so I had to then you know reach out to critics and a whole heap of other people to say what was it like what needs work <laughs> um, and so that was on at the end of last year and then since then I've been rewriting and I've been adding songs uh, but that that shows out of out of style for me because I'm not I don't tend to write um, I guess Irish folk music that's not really my strength um, but I felt when I started writing that show that it needed Irish music because the main character was from Ireland so um, so I investigated Irish music um, only to realize how complicated Irish music is <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so all of the songs in the show have a very much a Celtic sound um, and, you know, lots of Irish jigs, um, you know, but there's, I think, some quite beautiful pieces in there. So that's got a, a flute, a violin, a piano and a percussionist for that show. So that's, um, and the whole show is just five men who play lots of different characters. Um, but for me, the, the show is just, uh, the story at least, is such an important story because it's one about injustice where, in hindsight, it's, it seems unlikely, although he was put to death, that he was actually responsible for the crime. Um, the, people, the, the police officer that died in a shootout, it seems, was not shot by the guy that was put to death, which, um, yeah, it's really, for me, a really fascinating thing to have a look into historic stories and to sort of explore them. So there's that one, Captain Moonlight. Um, the oldest profession is one that um, we're in redevelopment mode. Um, that's a, a cheeky show set in um, in New Orleans in um, the red light district. And it's just filled with lots of naughty jazzy numbers, um, which, you know, I love writing lyrics to naughty jazzy numbers. <laughs> um, I was involved um, in uh, the collaboration of a show called Sempre Libera, which was uh, a cabaret-style opera, um, a very sort of strange take on opera. Uh, but the whole thing was really about exploring how women have, uh, or uh, female characters, have been treated through opera, um, which was a really interesting project to explore because so often, uh, for those of you that know about opera, opera has terrible stories for women, you know, Women often, you know, they, they die, they, you know, they're raped, they're whatever. There's all these horrible, horrible stories. They suicide actually a lot. <laughs> um, lots of terrible things happen to women in opera. So, um, so it was with a female opera singer here in Sydney that her and I over, I don't know, maybe a year, we, we, we talked a lot about, well, let's put that on stage. Let's just do a one woman opera show. Um, and I wrote a song for that called I Sing Opera, which is really a musical theatre cabaret take on, um, I guess, the silliness of opera and also the fact that opera is not everyone's cup of tea. Although I quite like opera, um, no one in my family does. <laughs> and so the song that I wrote, um, I Sing Opera, was really about um, trying to take a perspective of why people don't like opera and really just playing on why people don't like opera. Um, whether it's the self-indulgent nature of, you know, opera arias, <laughs> um, or whether it's just the fact that the, it's just the tone of opera that people don't like. So I wrote a funny little song for that. So that show started off as a, as a bit of a cabaret type show. And then um, the artist said, actually, I want it to be bigger. She said, I want there to be um, a whole orchestra. <laughs> um that sounds very much like a thing a prima donna would say, doesn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so we did. Um, I got an orchestrator on board and we orchestrated. And at the start of last year, just before COVID took off here in Australia, um, she performed a season of that show with a female orchestra. And it was interesting because... So it was um, in the time of International Women's Day is when we we staged the show. And um, and it was interesting because some of the friends that came to see the show, they said, do you know, I've never seen a female orchestra. <laughs> and that was a really eye-opening experience to sort of make us realise actually how male-dominated music, opera, you know, musical theatre even to some extent, how male-dominated these, these spaces are and how how exciting it was to actually see a whole female orchestra on stage. It, it had a, a really powerful message, I think. Um, so that was a fun, a fun show. And it's shows like that that for me are exciting because it plays into uh, an opportunity for me to sort of raise awareness around particular issues, whether it's, you know, the plight of women in opera, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, bush rangers who have been wrongly convicted, whatever it is, it's those sort of messages in, in uh, writing shows that, that I quite enjoy. Um, I'm in the process now of um, taking on a new project, uh, which is called the Murder Trust, which is um, set, I'm guessing, somewhere near where you guys are. Um, 
a true story in Prohibition times um, where basically a group of uh, men befriend an Irish guy who seems to be homeless, doesn't seem to have many friends. They befriend him and they take an insurance policy out on his life and then they try to kill him over and over and over and over again. Um, and each time he seems to survive until obviously the very end. But um, so that's the latest project that I've, I'm uh, getting involved with. So there's an American writer who lives in Sydney and he and I are looking at that as a, a future um, collaboration. There's another show, um, which is one based on um, an ancestor of mine. Um, I have an ancestor who, who was Australia's, modern Australia's first ferry man. Um, now Australia is, um, modern Australia is a, is a bit younger than modern America. Um, started out as a convict settlement um, and my, one of my ancestors uh, was sent here as a convict from England. But the interesting thing about that convict is that he was born in uh, New York uh, as an African slave. Um, and it seems in the War of Independence got out <laughs> somehow. I'm not sure. He ended up, no one really knows how. But he, uh, although he was born in America, um, ended up in London and lived in London for, I would say, maybe 10 years thereabouts, uh, stole some sugar uh, off a ship that he was lumping things on and off, um, and then was sent to Australia for seven years um, transportation, as they called it. Um, he then um, was said to be Herculean, so big, um, tall, African-American guy who lived in London, who then comes to Australia, quite worldly, I guess, for that time in history. Um, he ends up here and he makes a life here and he ends up then becoming a bit of a celebrity in very, very early um, the Sydney colony, um, becomes Australia's first ferryman and is eventually then granted 80 acres of uh, North Sydney by the governor, um, which is, such an unlikely story, to be honest. Um, although it happened, <laughs> unlikely, but it happened. Now that piece of real estate is right near the Sydney Harbour Bridge. My family does not own that anymore. <laughs> My family has probably not owned that for, for, for many, many generations. Um, so, but that story is one that is fairly unknown in Australia and um, is one that I've been working with um, a Sydney-based playwright and uh, an American, African-American playwright who has now moved to Sydney. Uh, so I'm in, we're in the very early stages of turning that into a musical. But that again is a, another fascinating story of, you know, I love historical, historical things. Um, and so all of those sort of projects, my main focus generally is music and lyrics. Um, from my perspective, that seems to be what I'm best at is music and lyrics. Script is not really uh, a strength of mine. And often I'll use script writers. Um, if the show is really dependent on script, a lot of my musicals don't tend to be so, so much script heavy though. They tend to be lyric heavy. So, um, so I'm wondering if there are, if, are there questions? Well, thank you, Jai. Um, before we get to questions, I yeah. would love to play your six pieces. Um, okay. Go and then you can, you know, you can talk about um, each one again. So, because um, there's a lot here, a lot of great stuff, and um, it's really great. I that last piece seems very fascinating. Um, uh, so let's go through the "If You Were Real" from Velveteen Velveteen Rabbit. Is that what it's called? Yeah. So and just Velveteen talk Rabbit, about. Yeah. This. And then we'll just play the song and then we'll go through all okay, six yeah, and then we'll. So, so the Velveteen Rabbit is uh, a, a 1922 children's story by Marjorie Williams. Very famous, uh, beautiful, beautiful story. Uh, I wrote this one quite a few years back. Um, and this song, this is actually four songs, which I've sort of joined together in this recording. Um, and basically the, the deal is that each one is a different toy picking on the Velveteen Rabbit, basically. So each character, is there's a train, there's a boat, there's a lion, there's a soldier, 
And they're all basically saying, I'm real, you're not real. Um, and then they're bombarding. And the poor rabbit at the end cries, <laughs> as you mentioned. Um, and this was recorded in 2013 when we premiered the show in Sydney. Um, so, yeah, have a listen to it. See what if you, you were think. real, then you'd be <laughs> up to date, just like me, with the latest, greatest new technology. You'd have gears, you'd have springs and mechanical things, and they'd envy you just like they envy me. Then I should be modern. Everyone likes modern. Everyone likes modern. Of course they do. Do you think that I can be? You're not with your technology a toy from history. If you were real, then you'd know. And your cockpit would show. Push something and pull a string, then you would go. You'll find up to date toys are the ones who make noise. And it's like nothing that you will ever. Like nothing that I will ever. Like nothing that you will ever know. I have never seen in my life a submarine. A toy unintelligent as steel. Like Navy boats, we smaller but slow cause That's what happens when you want to reel. So if I was smarter, everyone is smarter. Everyone is smarter. Of course they are. Who do you think that I can be? Now don't you dare rely on me, cause I'll be out at sea. Look at you and me, now the difference you see. A toy is so inferior, should kneel. I model hard, but you're not that smart. And that's what happens when you want to. That's what happens when I'm not. That's what happens when you want to reel. Heave away, cast off. From the things I could never tell Stephen. So talk now, about this song. So you're performing this uh, one anyway, so you don't need to play so the recording. recording. Well, we well, for them for the for their uh, purpose, absolutely, I should. Oh, okay, yeah, because uh, we, we need to share so, the song. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> this one is the. Uh, so uh, this one is the. Uh, so it's the final number from the things I can uh, never tell. Even it's the it's the final uh, song, which can be a duet, um, uh, uh, is written as a solo, duet, uh, um, and, and it's all about leaving. It's making uh, that very sad but self-empowered choice to leave 
uh, a relationship that's that's not going anywhere basically is the the whole gist of the song Where I can be without you Where I can forget about you I need me without you I knew that this was never lasting So then there's no point in asking me to stay One of my favorites that you've written. Um, oh, so good. That's for sure. That's a great one. So I'll have someone record it Sunday. I'm singing that song. Yeah. Maybe at the end, I'll sing it for you. We'll allow it. Good. So I'll play the piano and sing it um, and do the best I can do it um, with the composer there. Um, we'll do that again. <laughs> um, so the third song is My Little Possum. And from the things I could never tell Stephen. Let's talk about that one. So what's that one about? So this one is a cheeky little number about pet name. Um, so I think quite often, you know, we may have, for the people that we love, we might have some cute little names that we call them. So this song is really a list song. Um, so uh, uh, it goes so, through a lot of different pet names that we might call someone. Uh, but this is sung by the mother in The Things I Can Never Tell Stephen. And it just shows how obsessive she is over this son of hers and how much she loves him so much that she's actually sort of quite suffocating. So it's a comedic number. And this recording was from uh, the Sydney Fringe Festival version in 2017. And the performer actually is an opera singer. So... Um, it shows, you know, although it's musical theatre, there are, she brings in some of her opera -ness. Um So, yeah. And this is the same musical. This is from the same musical, the things I could never tell Steve. So, um, so let's listen to it. I love my darling. Oh! <laughs> 
<laughs> great well wow that was hilarious i we certainly enjoyed that different style from the same show that's great <laughs> all right so the next one is you only get what you pay for and this is from your show the oldest profession let's talk yeah. about that so this one is a cheeky so number um set in uh, New Orleans in um, the 1920s. Um, and this is performed by the madam of the establishment. Uh, and basically she's, um, she's singing to the girls in the establishment in terms of, you know, that uh, they have to make good, you know, business sense. Um, and, you know, they can't give away things for free, basically. Uh, she's saying. very jazzy. And um, it was a lot of fun to write this one. It's up. 
Great. So that one definitely has some New Orleans style in it and some 1920s. <laughs> We've got a couple people here that are some New Orleans fans. Oh, here. That good. style. We're, we're Americans, so we, we love that style. <laughs> um, so next one is I Sing Opera from Sempre Libera. And we talked about that earlier about, um, you know, women's roles in operas through the, the centuries. But let's talk about this particular aria and, and the why you wrote it and, and yeah. a little bit about the show. So although um, it's an opera show, um, it is, I've written it in a way that is very similar to an aria. It's got a, what we call a recitative at the beginning. Um, also sort of fun and cabaret as well, that sort of structure. Uh, and then it goes into a fairly typical waltzy sort of uh, opera style basically um and there's an opportunity here for the vocalists to just show off which again is a bit of a feature of opera so um so it's just meant to it's just meant to be a bit of harmless operatic fun is the whole point of the song um so yeah see see what you think of it that's great yeah. all right let's listen to i sing opera Oh, 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 oh,
<laughs> and our final piece is why not take a trip? And this is from out west to Penrith. Is that how you pronounce uh, it? Penrith. Penrith. Sorry. So, so this this song is <laughs> this is a this is just a standalone cabaret song that I wrote a few years back, which is about my hometown. Which is about my hometown. Now, my hometown is in Western now, Sydney, which uh, is often Sydney. sort of picked on by some of the more elite suburbs in Sydney. So I wrote this song to really Sydney, so poke fun at my, really my hometown and how much I love it. Nice. And you are actually performing in this. So I we am. get to actually <laughs> see you perform. And uh, that's going to be great. So... You can sing and play the piano, absolutely. So we'll definitely see that. So here is Why Not Take a Trip? <laughs> All right. When people ask me where I live, I never tell a lie. Though they prejudge, I don't hold a grudge. Instead, this is my reply. Not take a trip out west to Penrith The people there are really rather nice Where no one is annoyed Cause we're all underemployed And the housing there is two thirds of the price Why not take a train ride out to Penrith On the way you'll see some lovely views Or in the greater west Well you can't look underdressed even if you choose to not wear any shoes Penrith is quite outdoorsy And the quality of life is higher Though our food is full of grease And our people are obese Still we like to get around in sports attire Why not book a week and stay in Penrith? You might even bring your mum and dad I hope someday you do it and you make it past Mandruid to see Penrith really is 